Across the River Mersey, on the ferry to Liverpool. Look how beautiful the skyline is. And you sail back into Declan McManus's youth. I mean, Liverpool's really in your blood. It literally is in that my mother's from here and my dad's from the other side. A teenage Declan played his first paid gigs here. We play anywhere that have us. We play schools and poetry evenings. Then he moved to London, took our king's name, and became Elvis Costello. The spindly singer with the big specs and biting lyrics. Don't act like you're above me, just look at your shoes. Who the village voice would call the avenging dork. You were pretty angry on stage in the beginning. Maybe it came off that way. I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to deny it now, but I do think some of it's just the face you're born with. And, and, <laughs> and this gap in my teeth, you know, I said some people like Jane Birkin that made her incredibly sexy. Well, that obviously hasn't worked for me, but it does make things I say sound more emphatic sometimes than they are. So even if I'm saying something that's relatively reasonable or tender, it comes out as if it's a threat or a provocation. Was, was the Elvis part your idea? God, no. His stage name and a new pair of glasses came with his first record contract. I go to the office one day, I said, we've got a great idea. We're going to call you Elvis. And I thought they were kidding, you know. Put these on. And then they had, they'd obviously thought it out. I was too kind of nondescript looking, really. When his debut album, my Aim is True exploded in 1977. He still had a day job as a computer technician at a London beauty salon. You were writing songs at Elizabeth Arden? Yeah, after hours. Yeah. You know? So I'd take my guitar in the evening and I'd, you know, I'd be in there playing. One song came to him on a trip to Liverpool. Red Shoes literally came to you on the train? Yeah. Did you have the words and the music? Yeah. Yeah, the whole thing just appeared. Elvis would use Liverpool as a backdrop for his band The Attractions, shooting on the ferry ramp and at the observatory. It's like having the mad castle on the hill, you know, it had to be... <laughs> when you were a kid, you could imagine anything going on in here, you know. But Elvis grew up in London. I was born in the same hospital in which Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, he writes in his new memoir, Unfaithful Music and Disappearing Ink. I apologize in advance that I have not been the same boon to mankind. And we lived up in that top one up there. The McManuses lived on this quiet street in London's Twickenham neighborhood. His mother worked in a record shop. An hour of the evening. His father, Ross McManus, Notice the resemblance was a singer and trumpet player in a popular big band. In 1963, his dad played a royal command performance for the Queen Mother. Also on the bill that night were a little group from Liverpool called the Beatles. My dad brought home the Beatles autographs for me. So you glued them in your book? I glued them in my book, yeah. Elvis was 14 when he saved up to buy his first guitar. Did you have a guitar picked out? Uh, there was one in the window. It was in a store across the Thames River in Richmond. And then the day I got it was pretty great. I walked over with it over my shoulder, you know. Back across the bridge? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a musician now. You know? <laughs> You've talked about this whole idea, the sort of fluidity of identity. This also goes back to my dad. To make extra cash, his father would sing as other artists on cheap knockoff records. And they would do note-for-note -note covers of current hits. And he would be Frank Bacon and the Baconeers, or Hal Prince and the Layabouts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, was it unusual to be called Elvis? Not if your dad's Frank Bacon. You can be anybody. And have been. Sweet dreams are He's changed identities and writing partners. For a kid who loved the Beatles, what was it like to work with McCartney? Well, I thought it was a prank when, when I was told that Paul wanted me to come and write songs. But you don't turn up, you know, in your short trousers and your 
fan club card in your top pocket sticking out, you know. I mean, obviously you have to turn up responsibly with your guitar and a couple of ideas. Costello had the beginnings of a song about his grandmother grappling with Alzheimer's. We made it, Varnica, into a pop record that actually got onto the radio, even though it's speaking about the, the, the unraveling of a mind. I never thought that it would be like this, but now I see. A decade later, he collaborated with Burt Bacharach. That ended up starting what's become like a 20-year relationship. Yeah, I mean, we're still writing together, the now. They're writing two musicals. It's midnight and the phone rings and it's Burt Bacharach and Elvis, where are the lyrics? You know, and it, it's him driving it all the time, you know. Yeah. It's pretty great. Gee, it's great after being out late, walking my baby back home. He jumps genres from pop to classical to jazz. He once performed with an 80-piece orchestra at Royal Albert Hall. It's also where he saw his wife, jazz great Diana Krall, play one of his songs many years ago. I saw Diana play when we were first friends. She played Almost Blue as an encore. Mm -hmm. and I thought, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you had a pretty rowdy life when you were younger. And when you got married again in, in 2003, did you put that all away? I tried to put it away a bunch of times, you know. I mean, uh, to my shame, I didn't succeed in staying true to my first wife, who I d deeply love, you know, st still, she's the, she gave me that beautiful son. And Diana is, you know, very understanding of that. The rowdy's not gone away, but the rowdy's just, just, uh, just focused on one person. <laughs> and on two others, Costello and Crawl have twin eight-year-old sons together. TV people. <laughs> you seem to be really enjoying that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to know about Minecraft? <laughs> See you got a husband now. Did you leave your pretty fingers like At 61, Elvis Costello is still learning. You used to hold him right in your hand. And that's been the case in, in all of these adventures that might seem like wildly casting around for something to people who are, you know, um, dogmatic about rock and roll. So for you, it's been about the adventures. Totally. And about being a man of many musical hats. How many hats do you have? About 400. 400? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I always like them, man. They keep your brains in. Ha, 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 ha.